exciting. And he's uh, coached and mentored 15 guys that are now playing pro baseball. I'm sure that number's probably even increased a little bit. But he's a lifelong, he's a lifer in college baseball. He's an educator, he's a teacher. And Temple found a great one. Uh, very, very popular, very well-known assistant coach who was doing his time, ready to get the head job. And he got a head job at Temple University July 15th of this past year. Uh, it wasn't too long after being an alumni with Paul that uh, we reached out to him and just very open, very receptive. He's from Pennsylvania. I think he'll tell you where he's from and how his journey has uh, progressed. Uh, his family's still down in Richmond. So if you can imagine a uh, wife and three kids still down in the school system there trying to get it going at, at Temple. So you can imagine what, uh, what the commitment uh, is, uh, is like for not just him, but for, the spouse, for his spouse and children. But uh, I couldn't be happier for you all uh, because both Paul and I were college guys. We've Paul's played pro, I've played in the Olympics, and we're educators, we're teachers, we have an organization we think like no other. It's focused on development, 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 and exposure. So we're very fortunate to have Coach Wheeler share with you a college coach's perspective. He's the head guy. So really, it's going to be for you and your questions. And there's no question, you can't leave here saying, I wish, you know, I don't know about this, I was scared to ask that. You've got to ask the right questions. I'll give you some ideas. Multiple sports, when do you start focusing on baseball alone? Or do you play another sport, football, soccer, something, basketball, when you're in 10th grade, 9th grade, 11th grade? Um, are showcases important versus tournaments? What tournaments are important? Um, when should you narrow down a position? How do you contact the coach? I think the coaches are recruiting the kids, not the parents. So we have to teach our kids. I'm, I'm working that with my son. The, the, the child has to reach out to the coach and learn how to talk to the authority. They have to follow up with email. Is it all right to text? Uh, there's a blackout here where the coaches can't contact you. I think it's important for you to know those dates. Um, is it important to go to the university's camp versus a tournament? So there's a lot of questions, and there's a short window of time for you all to try to get a feel for it to maximize the opportunity. Make sense for you? So please, players, parents, ask a lot of questions when he opens it up for questions, okay? Because it's really important that you get that. Uh, because like I said, it goes so fast. I mean, I can't believe some of the kids. And uh, There was one kid, uh, one child, Cole Nars is here. I looked up, I said, hey, who's having a catch with Lee? Uh, I don't know. And I asked Roger, I said, that's Cole Nars. I promise you, he's getting this, he's this much taller. And I didn't recognize him. He's, kids are going so fast and it just happens blink of an eye so this is an awesome opportunity thanks for coming out on a Sunday but with uh, with that I'd like to introduce coach Ryan Wheeler coach. Uh, I'm good. thank you for that uh, great introduction um, I'm, I'm very excited to be here and, and when coach called and asked me to come and speak to y'all about the recruiting process uh, I jumped on it because part of why I got into coaching was to help people. Uh, that's one of my beliefs, one of the reasons why I coach. I certainly don't do it for the money, I can tell you that. Um, and as I've learned over the years, it's not just about helping uh, players on the field to get better as baseball players. You know, I help them once they become a part of my program to become better young men. But what I've learned is that this recruiting process is such a difficult process and it's such a big decision that I need to help educate families on how the process works. And I know you all, the t times have changed. 25 years ago when I was coming out of high school, this stuff didn't exist. The, uh, the, the travel teams didn't exist, the showcases, the camps, none of this stuff existed. Um, and, and now it's a very important part of the recruiting process. And so. A lot of things have changed uh, from parents from maybe when you were growing up and making your decision to go to college and some of you played sports, you know, how you made that decision uh, was much different then than it is now. But like I said, it's very complicated and there's NCAA rules, there's things that you can do that you can't do, and so trying to navigate through that can, can be difficult. And so if I have an opportunity here to speak to, uh, to all of you and provide some insight, answer questions, um, then, then it's going to be a great opportunity for you to learn today. So I want it to be educational. I want it to be informative. I want it to be interactive. 
I could stand up here and talk probably uh, for, for two hours just on a lot of the topics that uh, Coach brought up, and I'll do that. I'm, I'm in no hurry. I've got nowhere to be. Uh, my, as he said, my family's still in Richmond, so uh, I'm not rushing home to, to be with them. I will uh, stay and talk as long as, long as you all uh, would like me to. So, uh, as, as Coach mentioned, you know, my background, uh, First of all, I, I, I played at Penn State, which uh, maybe not a great name right now uh, with everything going on up there, but I had a wonderful experience up there and uh, got a chance to play at a school or a university that, where athletics are, are very big, and it's a big school. Um, I went on then, uh, played a couple years of professional baseball myself, so I have some background in professional baseball, but then jumped into coaching. And, and where I've been uh, with the College of William & Mary, uh, University of Pennsylvania, University of Richmond, and now Temple, I've had sort of a, a wide collection of, of different types of schools. Playing at a large school, a large university like Penn State, William & Mary, small uh, state school, very high academics, University of Pennsylvania, you know, Ivy League school, extremely high academics, University of Richmond, a little larger private type school, and now Temple, um, city school, on a larger scale, similar to Penn State. So my background uh, in, in coaching has uh, provided me with a lot of experience. And part of, the, uh, part of that experience is traveling all over the country. In any one given summer, uh, I would be from Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, to California and Washington, to Arizona, to Texas, to Illinois, to Florida, to Georgia, back to Virginia and the Carolinas. So I would be all over the place and I've met a lot of people and you know, the recruiting, the game, first of all, the game is still the same no matter where you go in the country. Uh, the recruiting is a little bit different um, just depending on where you go. But uh, I've, had, I've had a chance to meet a lot of people and, and uh, I've been in the trenches basically. I've been on the front lines of recruiting uh, for, for most of that 15 years. Uh, at least 12 of them and so you know I feel like I have a pretty good handle and understand how things work so please use me today as a resource to, uh, to, to get your questions answered so that you get a better handle on how this all works so where do we begin where, where do we start with all of this, uh, this decision-making process and when does it start well as I said the the times have changed and the recruiting cycle um, used to be you, you kind of waited until your senior year, get it moving into your senior year, and you would start looking at schools, and, and if you found some schools you liked, you maybe maybe committed early in, in that early signing period in November, but even then, you still, you applied to those schools, and then maybe some decisions were made in the spring of your senior year. I'm, I'm finding out now that there's guys that are sophomores, which would be 2014 grads that are now committing to university. And I know there's probably some 2013 guys, juniors, uh, that either you know uh, that, that are committed to schools already. And certainly there's a number of seniors uh, that have already committed to schools. So the timetable is moving up and the decision making process is being forced mostly by the, by the coaches, uh, but then it's a, it's a cycle uh, or it's like a dog chasing his tail uh, because some all it takes is for one 2014 guy to commit uh, to a certain school, and then the other schools say, well, geez, they've already got a commitment there. I guess we've got to go get a commitment. So then all of a sudden they start to scramble, and, and they go get a 14, and then the cycle just, just moves along at that pace. I'm not a big fan of the fact that the, the, the recruiting process has got speeded up that fast. All right? Um, from ninth grade to 12th grade, a lot of development takes place uh, among you, you guys that are players out here. You know, you may be you may be five uh, seven right now as a as a sophomore, um, and you may grow three or four inches in those those next two years. Okay, so there's a lot, and and, and certainly your game is going to change. Uh, and you know, I'm I, I feel like I'm I know what I'm doing as far as evaluating talent, but to be able to Project a guy in the sophomore year that's 5'7", 135 pounds, and say, oh yeah, he's going to be 6'3", and he's going to throw 89 miles an hour, I'm not that good, okay? I'm just not that good. So, 
you know, I don't understand what the rush is to get players committed on our end. This is from our end as college coaches. I don't understand what the rush is to get um, players committed so soon. I've got five players that are in the big leagues. Five players that are in the big leagues. All five of them, I signed them in the spring of their senior year, and I signed them for a $2,000 scholarship or less. $2,000 scholarship or less. So they weren't signed early, as we, as we call it, in their junior year, or even in the fall of their senior year, and they didn't come on big scholarships. And now they're, they're in the big leagues. So my belief is there are good players out there all the time. And there are so many people playing the game of baseball that it's my job to discover them, to go find them. That requires some work and some effort. I don't want to say that some of my colleagues in this business are lazy, uh, but they, they maybe want to get the recruiting over. It's easy to sign this guy right here. Let's get him committed. Now, certainly, a lot of these players that are committing early are very good players. All right, it's obvious when they're on the field that they've got the ability to do whatever it is uh, based on their position to play at the next level. But there's probably also 100 other guys out there, whether it's right here in the uh, Delaware, southeastern Pennsylvania, South Jersey area, whether it's uh, in the uh, mid-Atlantic region, the East Coast, or across the country, that could probably do the same thing. And so um, it's my job to discover them and to try to explore all the different avenues that, uh, that are out there to find these guys. One of the best decisions you guys have made so far is becoming a part of this organization here, okay? Because these guys here, uh, I, I didn't know them directly, or, or I knew them, but I didn't know them directly like I'm getting to know them now uh, until the last six months, but I knew of their organization, and I knew of the type of, of uh, or the type of program that they were putting together. And it's an outstanding program, as Coach said, that's built on development. And what they're doing, as far as helping you to become better baseball players, is certainly very important. But I think what they also do is help to educate you on the process, they give you the exposure, and they are a tremendous resource to opening up doors. If you weren't a part of this organization, it would certainly limit uh, some of the opportunities that you may have. When I was growing up, probably when these guys were both recruited at Temple, we didn't have this, you played Legion Baseball. You played high school baseball and Legion Baseball, that was it. And that was how you were discovered. And coaches came around and they watched you play, and that was sort of it. And, and we didn't hear a lot about schools from the South coming up here and recruiting uh, in, in the Northeast. And you didn't hear a lot of Northeast guys going down South to recruit guys. It was very regionalized. Well, now it's, it's almost national. And, and so you need someone or you need to be a part of an organization that has that experience, that has those, uh, those resources to open up those doors for you. So the first decision you made in becoming a part of this organization was a great one. Um, you know, back to where, when the process begins. I mean, you can start thinking about it. In ninth grade, you become a prospect, okay? That's an NCAA rule. So in ninth grade, that is when you technically become a prospect that is recruitable. Now, under NCAA rules, we're not allowed to have contact with you until uh, we can send an email September 1st of you entering your junior year. So if you're a freshman, which would be a 2015 guy, or you're a sophomore, 2014, you can call me and I can answer the phone call and talk to you on the phone that way, but I can't call you back if you leave a message. And you could send me an email, but I can't respond to your email. So be aware of that if you're, if you're one of those freshmen or sophomores and you're starting to send out emails, you don't hear anything back from me, I can send out a blanket response that says thanks for contacting us. However, under NCAA rules, I cannot really respond to your email. Thanks. Let us know when you reach uh, your junior year, September 1, and then we can start to have email correspondence. Now, once you get to your junior year, that email correspondence, we can go back and forth. And once again, 
the phone calls, you can make phone calls to me, I cannot return your phone calls. So understand that if you're leaving messages for coaches and they're not getting back to you, that's the reason why. Uh, then, so email correspondence can go on for that entire year. Then the big day, everybody looks forward to this day that's, that's going into their senior year, July 1st. July 1st, going into your senior year, that's the big day when coaches can call you. Guys sit by their phone and, and they're just waiting for that phone to ring and they're just, they're just dying for the coaches to call them. And some guys, the phone rings off the hook. They may, they may get 10, 15 calls. And some guys, they're sitting there and they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting and the phone doesn't ring. And then all of a sudden, they panic sets in. Oh, oh my God, what? nobody likes me. Nobody thinks I'm a good player. Relax, relax, okay? Uh, for a number of years, on July 1st, I was in an airplane flying from California to uh, back across to the East Coast or going the other way. I couldn't make phone calls. It was very difficult for me to make phone calls. So, you know, but I felt like on July 2nd when I called a guy, I had to apologize right away because I didn't call you on July 1st, sorry. You know, uh, I was flying, you know, and hoped that they understood. But relax, if that phone call doesn't come on July 1st, it's not the end of the world. But that is really the first time that we can contact you by phone. Now, the rules have changed with regard to phone calls. It used to be we can only make one phone call per week. Now, we are in an unlimited phone call period from that July 1st time until the signing date, which is the second Tuesday in November, around November 7th. So we could call you unlimited. I could call you on Monday, I could call you on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, if I really wanted to. Usually by Friday we run out of things to talk about, so uh, <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> but we can call unlimited then, and you can call us back. And it's alleviated a lot of problems, and I think it's been a good rule change because there's just a lot of things that go on as far as making a decision. But anyway, uh, once we hit that this November time period, so right now I'm in a one phone call per week uh, mode again. The rules change back. Complicated for you to understand. And I wish they would just change the rules so it was unlimited all the time. But because now what's happening is players that are seniors that are calling me, that we're recruiting, you know, if I've already talked to them once that week, I can't call them back. And I have to explain it to every single one because they don't seem to understand the rule. So that's how the phone calls work. Text messaging, off limits. There's a proposal back on the table with the NCAA to allow us to text message again. Um, I'm against it, to be honest with you. I have so many people that text message me, coaches, uh, my current players. It's just a, a big mode of communication, but I don't want to be typing on my phone all day long. And if they put that rule back into effect uh, to where we're allowed to text message again, I may have to hire somebody just to stand next to me and just type in my text messages just because I'll need to keep up with the uh, recruiting that's going on by other coaches. There's some coaches that will sit there and that's all they'll do is text message guys all day long. You know, while they're playing on the field, hey, you look great. You know, you, I'm watching you here on the side. You really look good. That's the way they'll, they'll do it. And, and then, you know, the next guy, they're texting the same thing. I don't have time for all that. I'd like to at least watch the games and, and evaluate players on the field. I don't want to be spending all the time uh, on, on phone texting. So texting is off limits. And I do have players or prospects that text me. And I can't do anything with it. So we'll see if that rule changes, but it's off limits for everybody as of right now. Um, so the process begins as early as ninth grade. And, and for you guys, I think the first thing you need to do, you know, now that you're uh, involved in this organization and you know starting to understand how the process works what I'm about to say next is going to go against that um, because the real reason you go to college is for your education that is the real reason why you go to a university so you need to start to put together a list of schools that you're interested in and you need to remove the baseball component from that, take that out of the equation, all right? You need to find out what type of school you think you'd like to go to. And some of the things that go into making that decision or trying to decide is, you know, do I want to go close to home or far from home? You know, I grew up here in, in Delaware or New Jersey or Pennsylvania. I don't know if I want to go to school. I want to go to Arizona or I want to go to California or I want to go down south. 
Okay, so you need to figure out where you want to go. Do you want to stay close to home? Do you want to go uh, far away? Do you want to go to a big school? Do you want to go to a small school? Private school, state school? In the city, in the suburbs, or, or in the country? Those are some of the things that you need to start to, to investigate and think about uh, as you put together your list of schools. And then certainly you need to look at the school and what, what do I want to study? Someday baseball will end for me. I hope I'm looking at a lot of future major leaguers here. Any Albert Pujols is in the, uh, in the audience here that are going to sign for $254 million and never really have to worry about working the rest of their life. Um, if there are, good for you. But probably for the rest of you, baseball will end at some point. And you need to have that college degree in your back pocket. That's what sets you up for the rest of your life. Now, some of us, you know, we stay in baseball and continue on in the, uh, continue our career as coaches or scouts or whatever the case may be. But um, some of you may want to be accountants, engineers, doctors, lawyers, um, psychologists, whatever it may be that interests you. You need to look at those schools uh, and, and decide what it is that you want to study. And the internet now is a great way to do that. You can get on the internet and you can investigate schools and, and find out all about them uh, at the touch of your fingers. Years ago it was kind of hard to do that. You had to request information and, and things like that. Now you can do it all online. And put together a list. It might be 10 schools. It might be 15 schools. Um, whatever it may be, but come up with a, with a large list. And that's where you start from there. Now, you're part of this organization and you do some traveling, all right? Take the opportunity to maybe go and see some of these schools on your travels, okay? Um, you can look at a school online, you can get the information, and yeah, I think this is a school for me. I think I like this place. But then you go and, and see it and you're like, oh, wait a minute, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. You know, I, I don't really like it. Um, you know, I thought it looked much bigger, it looked much nicer in the pictures online, but you know, now that I'm here, eh, I, don't, I don't really think it's for me. So take the opportunity to go and visit the school on your own and, and see what it's all about. Maybe take the admissions tour and have them talk. You know, usually those tours are very informative. They'll walk you around campus, they'll give you a lot of the background on the school, uh, admissions requirements, uh, size of the school, cost, all that stuff. Probably should take you into some of the buildings. You'll get to see some of the classrooms, see some of the dorms, see what it's like to maybe be a student at that campus. That is very important to do that. Once again, I go back to, to years ago, everybody used to wait until they were offered an official visit to that school. An official visit to go visit that school and spend time with the team and the coaches. Those are sort of a thing of the past. Guys are making decisions so early now that there's, we don't offer official. We offer them still if guys want to take them. But really, you know, in a, in a given year, you know, 10 years ago, we used to maybe have eight to 10 official visits. Now we save our official visits till after our guys have committed. We bring them all in together and give them a chance to to sort of meet each other and, and get to know each other before they are going to join us in the fall of that next year. So. Don't wait for the official visit is my advice. And you cannot take an official visit until you begin classes in the fall of your senior year. So they, nobody can offer you an official visit in the summer of going into your senior year after your junior year. They can't offer it to you one in your junior year at all. So, um, so take the opportunity to go on your own. That's what most people are doing these days and, and explore the school and, and find out what it's all about. Um, now that list may start to narrow down. You may have had 10 schools, and you, and you maybe not, you're not able to get to all of them. All right, but let's say you get to seven or eight of them, and you know what, two or three of them, I really just didn't like what I saw. I don't think it's the right fit for me. Um, and so you, uh, you cross those off. So now your list gets narrowed down a little bit. So maybe it's four or five schools. And these are really your, sort of your dream schools where you would go to be a student. Now this is where it gets complicated, because all of a sudden then, Three or four schools over here that you weren't even thinking about pick up the phone and give you a call or tell coaches here that they're interested in you as a potential student athlete at their university well now all of a sudden you've got 
these schools over here that you had no idea you didn't even think about. Um, and now you have to start to make some decisions and you need to explore and find out about those schools. So it's almost back to square one again in investigating those schools and getting online and finding out the information. Okay? As I said, you got to try to remove the baseball component at all times. And even though these schools over here now are interested in you as a baseball player and a student athlete at their university, you still need to go investigate and try to take the baseball part out of the equation. Because if you get on campus there and something happens to where you get injured and your career is over on that particular day, you need to ask yourself, well, would I be happy here as a student then and going to school without baseball being a part of of the equation. And if you can answer yes to that question, then you keep moving forward with the process. But if it's not a place where you can see yourself, and the only reason you're really going there is because Coach uh, XYZ is interested in, and wants you to come there for baseball reasons, then it's probably not, not the right fit, okay? In the grand scheme of things, this is, this is about the right fit. This is about your future, not mine, all right? This is one of the biggest decisions you'll make in your life, and especially as you're starting to enter into being an adult, it's sort of the first big step that your big decision that you're gonna make. And so you want it to be the right one. You don't wanna go to a school simply because the baseball coach wanted you to be there. You're unhappy, you're not playing, uh, and you wanna transfer them. You wanna leave and go to a different place. We'll get into transferring if we need to, but, but the rules and everything, it becomes very complicated and it's no fun to have to go, go through that process. So make the decision right the first time and take your time to do your homework. And this is why going back to the whole process being rushed and pushed and, and coaches forcing guys to make decisions, I see too many bad decisions being made because families haven't taken time to really investigate the school and find out if it's the right fit. They're so caught up in, oh, this, this program wants me and they like me and, and the, the coaches, you know, send me emails telling me how great I am and what a bright future I've got here and so on and so forth. And they get caught up in that and they forget to explore the other things that we talked about earlier. And then they make a decision, they get down there, and then what they find out is, well, maybe the situation isn't working out quite like I thought. They were recruiting me as a shortstop. I thought I was the only guy. I come in and there's three other shortstops that they brought in the <laughs> you know, that's They didn't tell me that on the phone, you know? Um, and then some things start to change. And so, rushing the decision. You make the decision when you want to make it. One of the questions that I always ask prospective uh, student athletes is what is your timetable? Some guys, Want, you know, some guys are going to tell me, you know, coach, I've got 15 schools on me. You know, I'm going to make my decision here in the next month. Okay? Or some guys will tell me, hey, I'm taking my time. You're really the only coach that's called me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going around investigating schools. I'm probably not going to make my decision for another three months. So I get a feel from them what they're thinking as far as making making their decision. And then I have to find out and see if that jives with what we're where we're at in the recruiting process. And if I'm ready to, if I feel confident enough about this young man and we're ready to move, then, you know, our timetable may match up with his and, and we may move forward. But if I think it's moving too fast, I am not afraid to back away from, from recruiting a guy because I don't know or feel comfortable enough with making him a part of what we're doing at the university that I'm at. So one of those questions that I ask right up front is, what is your timetable? You need to figure that out. Each and every one of you is different, but what I can tell you is be, be patient. Take your time, do your homework. It's about your future and finding the right fit for you. Um, now, let's bring the baseball component back in a little bit, okay? The school's a match. They have what I, I want to study. It's the right distance from home. It's the right size. Man, I went there and, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I can really see myself being a student there. Great. And now the baseball program wants me. Boy, that's, that's like the cherry on top of the sundae. Well, now you need to start to investigate the baseball program a little bit, all right? You need to find out uh, exactly who's on their roster. You know, if you're a, if you're a shortstop, um, 
they may have three or three other shortstops that are sophomores. All right, they're a year or two ahead of me, going to be there another year or two, so coming in the door, I may not get a chance to play right away. And that's a question you need to ask yourself as you start to look at these programs. Do you, know, you want to play as a freshman or do you want to go to a program where you're, you're going to maybe sit and not get an opportunity to play? You just practice and you kind of learn the ropes and you know, maybe by your sophomore year or junior year, you, know, you get that opportunity to start. Um, but look at the roster, see what, what they have as far as guys in front of you at that position, okay? Um, look at where, where their roster is comprised, all right? If you want to go to a school down in South Carolina and you look at their roster and every guy on their roster is from the state of South Carolina, chances are you're probably not going to get an opportunity coming from Delaware, Jersey, or Pennsylvania to, to be on that team. They're just, they don't recruit up here and, and they're not looking for players. I'm not saying it will never happen, but chances are it's probably not, not going to happen for you. So things like that uh, you, you need to, to look at. Um, as I said, trying to decide, you know, what, what you want to do when you get there. As far as do you want to play right away, do you want to sit? Do you want to go to a big time program uh, that's maybe ranked in the top 25 um, and, and maybe have to wait your turn to, to play? Or do you want to go to a small school where, you know, you might get that chance to play right away as a freshman and be, be an impact to help that, that program win? There's some Division I schools that are that way. There's Division three schools that are, that are that way as well. Don't get caught up in Division I, two, or three. Everybody wants to go to Division I. I understand that. That's great. I think it's great to just try to strive to be at the top. But I'm telling you, there are Division three programs out there that would absolutely kick a lot of Division I teams rear ends if they play. There are a lot of great Division II programs out there that are the same way. So don't get caught up in Division One, Division Two, Division Three. All right, that really shouldn't factor into it. All right, go there, look at the roster, start to just get a feel for how that team works. What do they have on the roster? Who's in front of them? Things like that. Now, when you're visiting these schools, if you get an opportunity to meet with the coach, I think that's outstanding. And you can simply send an email to them and just say, "Hey, I'm coming to visit and." Two weeks, uh, if you have 10 minutes, I would like to, to just introduce myself and ask you a couple questions, okay? If you only want to take up 10 or 15 minutes of their time, there's a good chance, well, there's a, not a good chance, there's a chance you may be able to meet them. If you say, I would like a two hour sit down meeting with you, probably not gonna hear back from that coach. I right? just have too many things going on and uh, just don't have the time to spend two hours with uh, every individual that wants to do that. But hopping by, I think it's a great way to put yourself uh, in front of that coach and maybe, maybe get the ball rolling. I am consumed every single day by emails and phone calls from prospective people that are interested in my school. I didn't know, I, I had no idea uh, how many people would be interested in Temple. I, I've been blown away by the number of kids that have reached out to me. And not just from this area. I'm getting emails from kids from California, from Canada, from Illinois, I mean, all over the country that I have looked online and they're throwing some things in their email that tells me that they spent some time sort of investigating the school and that they are maybe genuinely interested in Temple. So I need to sort through that. Since I've been, um, I started the job August 1st, just to give you an idea of the number of kids that have, that have been to the um, August 1st, I started at Temple. We have, we make databases, all right? We collect the names of, of kids that have sent us emails and shown interest in us. From August 1st up until, I think two days ago, I looked at uh, our database of just 2013 kids that have written us. I've got uh, 395 names. 395 kids in just that period of time uh, have, have sent me emails uh, on their interest level in, in Temple. Now that doesn't uh, count in there the uh, different rosters and different ways that we collect information 
uh, on players. My, my 2013 list of kids is probably close to six or 700 names already that we're trying to sort through. So how do you separate yourself amongst those, those 700 kids if you're really interested in testing? Because at the end of the day, we're only going to be able to take six to 10 guys out of that 700. And that list will grow probably by the time we get to next summer. That list will be close to 1,500 names of 2013 guys. And I got to pick six to eight, six to 10 guys out of that. Well, certainly, like I said earlier, being a part of this organization here, that's going to be the first step. And then putting yourself in front of that coach is the next thing. By, by going and visiting the campus, maybe as a junior, popping in for 10 minutes, oh, now I can put that face to a name. You know, I've got all these names here. I don't know. 98% of those kids are, other than what they've written me in email. But when I meet somebody, they stop by my office, all right, that sort of moves you ahead of everybody else. Now, beyond that, sort of the next step then is putting yourself in front of those coaches for them to see you and evaluate your abilities. <coughs> and that can be done in a wide variety of ways, all right? Certainly being a part of this, this program here where they uh, have teams and they travel around and play in the tournaments and things like that, outstanding way. We travel to those tournaments and we watch those games. Showcases. Yes, I think it's important to, to maybe do some showcases. So that's another way that you can uh, that you can put yourself in front of coaches. Individual schools camps uh, is, is another way that you can put yourself in front of uh, in front of the coaches. Videos is another way that you can put yourself sort of in front of coaches. And I'll come back to videos here in a minute, but let's talk about the, the tournaments, the showcases, the schools that you All right? I have found players over the years from all of them. All right, there's not one particular one that I endorse or say that's the most important. I think it's a, just a combination of things. You gotta remember, we're chasing names. So sometimes decisions are made on where we go based on the number of kids that are gonna be there. If I know I'm going to a particular event, whether it's a tournament or a showcase or a camp, that's gonna have 100 kids compared to picking another event over here that may only have you know, a team and maybe a Legion ball game or something like that, where I'm gonna have you know, two teams and maybe one kid that I'm looking at, I'll probably take the one that's got 100 kids. Unless I know this guy over here is really damn good and, and I've gotten some more information on him, you know. But I'm probably going to choose the one that, that, that's big, where I can say, uh, you know, kids have written me and, and 20 of them out of those 100 have said they're going to be at that event. All right, there's 20 names that I can go kind of get an initial feel for and see and decide can they play or not. I can, you know, out of that 20 then, maybe pick the three or four that I like and we move forward and I want to see them again. So, you know, sometimes that happens in a showcase format. Sometimes these tournaments that have 8, 10, 12 teams in uh, all right, it's kind of a good bang for our buck. We're going to go to watch that tournament because I can, you know, check out these various teams and see these players and, and make some decisions. Um, schools, individual camps. You... As I said earlier, we're collecting these names, we're making databases. Um, it's, it's hard for us to get out there and see everyone. So we put on these camps uh, as a way to give you an opportunity to come to our school and put yourself in front of us. Now, I will tell you that I'm not in the business of holding these camps so that I can make money and you know, don't care about uh, what happens at the camps. I really put on the camps, one, to be able to teach guys the game of baseball, and hopefully they leave there with something that makes them as a better player. And then two, give them an opportunity to come see our school and to put themselves in front of, in front of us as, as a coaching staff. For me, when a guy is, makes a commitment to come to our camp, that tells me that he's really interested. If, they're really, if you're taking the initiative to pay the money, to come whatever distance it is that you may come to be at our camp, you really have a have a pretty strong interest in our in our school. So I feel very compelled to um, to 
to spend time with everyone, to put on a, um, or to put a product out there basically to where you leave saying, all right, I feel like I was fairly evaluated. I got a good opportunity to uh, interact with that coaching staff and understand how things work there. And I got a chance to see that school. And on top of that, I got some, I picked up a few things offensively, defensively, pitching, whatever, which made me a better player. But you can't possibly go to every school's camp uh, out there. You just don't have the money. And you don't have time to go to every camp or showcase out there. It's just impossible. So you really need to start to, to try to pick and narrow down the showcases and camps based on, once again, what you're looking for. If the camp or, or showcase is advertising the schools that are going to be there, and let's say uh, you want to go down south, and all the coaches that are going to be there from the New England area, it's probably not the right showcase for you. Because if you have no interest in going up there, then you put yourself in front of coaches that you really have no interest in, in talking to or exploring. If you're dead set on going down south, then you need to probably find a showcase or a camp uh, that, you know, puts you in front of those coaches. So I think the great thing about the program here is that the different tournaments and things that you play, you're playing teams from all over. And so you're going to attract coaches from the South, from the Mid-Atlantic, from the New England area. Um, and so you're going to be exposed to maybe some places that you didn't even think think about going to school. And you're going to get that, that wide array right there. But pick the camps and showcases based on your interest in who you want to put yourself in front of. It makes no sense to me to, uh, to go to a school go to one of those things, and you're not even interested in any of the schools that are in attendance there. So, um, which ones do I recommend, or which, I, I can't say, per, you know, this one's better than that one. Uh, I, I, one, I gotta be careful in who I, uh, which one I endorse over another, but, you know, I think in some ways they're all good, and it's really up to you guys to figure that out. Now, back to the video part, which is another way to kind of get yourself in front of, uh, of a coach. I would say 99% of the time, we do not make final decisions off of watching a video. There's been a couple of rare cases where we've taken a chance on the guy, uh, but for the most part, videos just give me an idea. You could tell me in your email that you're 6'3", 195 pounds, you're a left-handed hitter, left-handed thrower, you run a 6'8", uh, you know, you have this arm strength from the outfield, here's my stats, all this stuff. It's like, wow, this is, you know, this guy's a great player. Look at him on paper, I gotta have this guy. You know, they, they send me a video clip, and I pull that video clip up, and it either confirms what they're telling me in the email, or it, it doesn't. And so videos can work for you or against you, but I think for the most part they, they work for you. Um, because it's just, like I said, it's just so hard, all the different events out there, for us to cover the ground necessary. So it gives me something to go on. It sort of puts you ahead of the other 500 guys that are sending emails to me and telling me that they're all 6'3", 105 pounds long. So, so we can see arm action. We can see, uh, depending on what you show me in the video, we can see certain things and decide, yeah, you know what, this guy's, this guy's interesting. Uh, there's some things there that I like. I need to go see this guy in person to see if, see if it matches up. Um, so I think the videos are great. Please don't send us footage of your big championship game uh, from the spring season. I don't have two hours or three hours to watch that whole entire game. If I did, I would have come to the game probably and watched it in person. And a lot of times, you know, the video or the footage is taken through the fence and you're about this big on the screen and I'm trying to figure out well, which, which one is easy. The pitch, because in their email description, they don't tell me what position they play. Here's some video footage of the state championship game that I played in. Great. Who are you on the field? I don't know and I can't see. I can't see how you throw or run or hit when you're this big. So, please don't send that to me. Well, keep it short. Two to five minutes is, is all we really need. And you know, no pitcher, you know, have uh, an end. Is there anybody in the business of making videos here in, in high school, you know, for college players, for high school players? 
Okay, good. I want to make sure before I said that you don't need to go out and spend $2,000 with one of these companies to put together the professional video with the music and the graphics and all that stuff. I could care less about uh, that stuff. All right, I don't need all the bells and whistles. With I want to see what you can do as a player. So, you know, if you're a pitcher, have uh, the, the person uh, recording you off to the side so we can see your delivery, your arm action from the side view. Maybe they can get behind you and film some pitches there, or if they can get behind the catcher uh, with the screen, that's fine too. But the side view and either front or behind uh, are the two, two views that we need to see. Eight, ten pitches from either from either angle is what we need to see. All right, show us your fastball, show us your off-speed pitches, um, and and that's that's really it. If you're a position player, you know if you if you're an outfielder, just taking some fly balls and seeing the throw. Uh, three, four, five fly balls, ground balls is all we need. Sometimes guys like to to uh, start off with having a close-up of the guy catching it and then they pan back so that you can see you know the guy throwing all the way to third base or home plate that's great uh, but sometimes the video maybe that's where a professional needs to come in sometimes gets lost but we don't always know the distance all right so I'd rather just have the close-up and just see an arm match that's what I'm most concerned about but um, some guys will put them running the 60 yard dash on there great I'm, I'm not Sometimes I'll sit there with a stopwatch if I can, but it's not always accurate. But I'm looking more at your form than I am at, at your actual time. All right, if you tell me you're a 6'5 runner, and I watch the video, and I kind of clock in it, and it's like 7'2", something's not jiving. Or I see you running with your arms and stuff like this, I'm like, this guy's a 6'5 runner. So that's where the video can work against you. So don't lie in your video and tell me you're a 6'5 runner when you're really a 7'5 runner. Uh, hitting, or, or infielders. Just watch you taking ground balls. All right, I don't need to see you actually throwing the ball all the way across the field. <coughs> I want to see your hands, your feet, your glove action, your body control. Those are things that I'm looking at. All right. Offensively, then, having some swings from your open side and maybe some swings from behind, behind you uh, as a hitter is all we need to see. So two to five minutes. You know, try to fit it in in that time frame, and um, and that's all we'll need to see. And that will either make us say, you know what, I need to see this guy uh, in person, or I'm not so sure, you know, uh, he kind of goes over here in this class um, for right now. So, that's my thoughts on video. Um, and now we can go in a whole host of directions from here, with where the process, where the process goes. Um, Let's start with the school that's interested in. First of all, does anybody have any questions up to this point? Yeah. Yes. When you talk about the videos, uh, do you want them under game conditions or if you can is edit it better them. under game conditions or not? If you can edit the videos, yeah, like I said, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily want to see the guy's entire bat because right. it just it takes too long. I'm, I'm going to sit there sure. saying, come on, let, let's go. Uh, but if you can splice and edit the video to see, you know, a guy's swing, that, that's fine. Well, uh, as opposed to, you know what I mean? Well, I, like, like I said, I'm go out not... And just shoot somebody, you know, like taking ground balls or... Well, I know that if you show game. me game footage, if you show me game footage, you're probably not going to show me footage of him striking out or making an error. So I know it's only going to be good stuff. Like I said, the videos, so you're sending good things, so it must be... A good player. Okay, that's fine. If I want to see game footage, I'll come see you in person. I want to see, you know, like I said, that the guy that describes himself as, as a future major leaguer on paper, and then I watch him throw and he's, he's doing something like this, you know, and that's probably not a guy that I'm, I'm going to be interested in. Uh, or, like I said, he, he runs like he's with his arms out and doing something crazy. Probably not going to be interested in him. So, um, so I'd rather see the workout stuff okay. just to get an idea. That, that's Great. what we're talking about there. Any other questions on things? Yes. Uh, when, you, when you look at um, players and you say that you can have as many as 1,500 possibly before you finally start to narrow it down, when you narrow it down, how concerned are you with SAT scores or their, or their view yeah. as far as who you will be? Now, uh, and, and that's good. I mean, we'll kind of move into 
how do, yeah, how do we start to decide and what, how do we evaluate players? Uh, so, yes, to answer your question, one of the first things we look at are the grades. So, I told you that your recruiting clock starts in ninth grade. What you need to be aware of academically is that schools are looking at an, from an admission standpoint at your grades from ninth grade all the way through until the time you graduate. So, if you're in ninth grade, make sure you're getting on the ball and doing, doing your work in the classroom, okay? Because you don't want to have a poor ninth grade year and then say, oh yeah, I guess I gotta think about college and now it's time to start focusing on, on schoolwork. Um, and then have somebody, so in a few years down the road, have an admissions department come back and say, you know what, if he would have gotten a B instead of a D back in ninth grade here, we probably would have let him into school. Like that's what you don't want to have happen. So my biggest piece of advice from that from here is do well in school. You should do well in school anyway, um, but understand when it starts to count. And really that's the first piece of information that we look at is, is um, your SATs and your GPA. And some of the schools that I've been at before, boy, I just go down that list and cross off guys, you know, left and right that didn't have the requirements to get into that school. Um, Temple's a great school. Their admission requirements are a little bit different, so some doors are open that maybe weren't open to me before. But there's still guys that, you know, not a good student, cross them off. Don't have the right SAT scores, cross them off. Um, for right now because academically they don't fit. You could be the next Albert Pujols or Roy Holiday, but if you don't have the grades for me to get you into school, it doesn't matter. I don't care how hard you throw, how fast you run, how much power you've got, whatever it is that you bring to the baseball field uh, to the table that way, if you don't have the grades, it doesn't matter. So admissions is a big, big component and um, that's, that's part of the decision-making process on our end on how we sort through players. But when we show up for these events, what are we looking for? What are we, are we paying attention to? A lot of times you see the coaches standing there twirling their stopwatch and talking with the other guys and you think they're not paying attention. Some of them may not be. Uh, but for the most part, we're watching all the time. All right? I'm gonna give, now, I'm gonna give you what I look for and how I, mean, I do things, but there's, 300 Division I programs out there, and all of them have coaching staffs, and, and then there's the Division II, Division III, so there's hundreds, thousands of coaches out there. Everybody's opinion is a little bit different on how they evaluate and look at players, and that's what makes this whole recruiting train go. If, I mean, if we all like just the exact same guy, then nobody else would have an opportunity to play, but what I see in a guy, the coach next to me may see something different, and the guy over here may see something that's different in both of us, and so, Everybody's a little bit different, but I like to get to the ballpark early, and I like to see see guys uh, as they go through their warm-ups. Sometimes I even like to get there and see them get off the bus um, and how they show up at the field. All right, you a lot of times get one chance to make a first impression. All right, so that impression needs to be a good one. Um, if you're a guy that has cut-off sleeves and uh, you wear your shorts that are halfway down your, your butt, um, your high tops are untied, and you've got double earrings and a bandana on, that's one impression. It may not be the, it may not really necessarily be who you are, but a lot of times it tells us something about you. Um, and some coaches, I like that. That's the guy they want. They want that guy. Okay. Um, personally, that's not really my style. That's not maybe the guy that I want. Um, but as you get off the bus, how do, you, how do you look? How do you wear your uniform? What do you do then when you go to the dugout? How do you go out there and stretch? And then we watch guys play catch and watch them warm up and see how they're going about their business that day. Um, and then certainly we watch the ball game and uh, <coughs> pay attention to different things that they're doing on the field. A lot of times, well, in this whole process, the two things that, that matter to me are what you have ability-wise and then what you are as a person, so your character and makeup. Ability and character and makeup sort of put the picture together for me as to what whether I, I want you to become a part of our program. Now. So you can have all the ability in the world, but if your coach gives you some piece of advice and you scream at him on the field, I don't want that guy. Or you strike out and you just fire your helmet into the dugout, I don't want that guy. Okay? 
Um, in fact, I like to come and see guys fail in the baseball game. I like to see you strike out in a big situation to see how you handle it. Because you know what? When you get to a college campus, it's probably going to happen. You're probably going to fail you know, at that university when you get there. And so how do you handle it? Do you, you know, hey, I struck out. The guy made a good pitch. Um, I competed. But you know what? He got the best of me in that, that particular at bat. Go back, put my bat in the bat rack, put my helmet down, get my glove, sprint out to the field to go play defense. Or do you fire your helmet? Or, you know, the next thing you walk out to the field like this. You know, I mean, that tells me a lot about you as a person. The character and makeup side of things is the hardest part to, to figure out. Okay, that's the hardest part to figure out. I can assess your ability pretty quickly, and I can determine whether you can throw, hit, run, pitch, catch, whatever. And I can say, all right, this is where I think it's going to be down the road. But what kind of person are you is the tough one to figure out. And that's what we've got to invest in. Here. And that's why going back again to this whole process of it being rushed and that decision being forced upon you, I don't think it's good because I don't think you get a chance to really know the, the person or the, the young man that you're recruiting or the family that you're asking to become part of the program. It takes a little bit of time to have those conversations to, to meet them and get a, to get a feel. Because the last thing that I want is to bring problems into my program. I have enough things to worry uh, to do during the day and over the course of the year. The last thing that I want to spend time on is dealing with you getting in trouble academically or <coughs> getting in trouble with the law, you know, doing something crazy uh, on campus or off campus. Constantly having to hold your hand and walk you through every single step every day. I'm going to be there to take the reins from mom and dad to continue to help develop you and, and shape who you are and um, teach you, but I'm not going to come over to your dorm room every day and wake you up to go to class and make sure that you're going. I'm not going to come over there and clean your room and fold your laundry, all right? That is, that's part of growing up. So I need to have mature, responsible young men that can handle that. They, they have that initiative, that responsibility to do all those things and take care of them. And um, I can say this about the, uh, the young men at Temple that, uh, that I've inherited. They are the most fantastic group of guys that, that I've had. And I've had some great teams and some very good players, but as a whole, these young men have been phenomenal. And knock on wood, I haven't had one issue that I've had to deal with this fall. I mean, I was concerned. I didn't know what kind of guys I was getting. And I haven't had to bring anybody into that office and sit them down and say, okay, look, here are the rules. You broke them, now here's the, the punishment, all right? So um, I hope that continues for the spring. But accountability is very big, at least with me. I want young men that are accountable, okay? I need to know that they're going to class, that they're getting their work done. If they have a meeting with a, a tutor or a professor, they're gonna follow up on it. If they have a meeting with the uh, training room, they're going to be there, they're going to be on time. I think all that stuff relates to them, things on the field, but I am counting on them to make a play, make a pitch, get a hit. I know I can count on them because they put the time in, they put the work in, um, and it may not always work out, but I know that that's the best guy in that spot to help us try to win a ball game, I can count on them. So accountability is very big. And then it, it goes beyond baseball then. You know, I, I tell guys all the time, you know, if mom or dad doesn't pay the cell phone bill for you, well, guess what happens? There's, there's a consequence. You got no cell phone. If they don't pay uh, the um, heating bill, well, you got no heat. So you need to learn that if I don't go to class, well, there's a consequence for that. So we hold our guys accountable uh, very much in our program. So we need to learn that about them in the recruiting process. And that happens through the phone calls. That happens to uh, the on per, on campus or on campus or off campus contacts and visits that we have with them. So going back to one of the points that, that coach talked about earlier, parents interaction. How involved should they be in the whole process? Obviously, moms and dads, you know, you've raised these young guys. Uh, you know, you've been a big part of their life. We all want what's best for our children. And I haven't met a set of parents yet that's told me that their son is a loser and he stinks and he's a bad kid. 
every parent I've ever run into has told me how great their kids are. That's what I expect. But I don't need you to call me every day and tell me that. I don't need you to send me emails to tell me that. I, I kind of figured that's what you're going to say about it. Okay? Um, so we want you to be involved in the process because it's such a big decision and you've got you know, experience in life making big decisions. But you don't need to be the driving force behind it. As Coach says, let your sons do the work. Let them send the emails. Let them uh, return the phone calls. Let them the one where if you meet a coach, ask the questions. You may have a question and it's fine if you ask it. Okay, that's, that's okay. I'm not saying you can't speak. However, don't be sort of shutting little Johnny out over here and you're dominating the conversation. Or I call him and ask for a return of phone call and you pick up the phone. Well, he was, he was busy last night uh, doing homework and, and he didn't have a chance to call you back. But, so I thought I would call him. Okay, I, that's great, but I really don't want to talk to you. If I wanted to talk to you, I would say in my message, you know, Mr. So-and-so, please give me a call back. I need to speak to you. All right, so let the kids do it. All right, you, you guys take the initiative to be the ones that sort of lead the charge here, okay? Because we're going to be coaching, or I'm going to be coaching you. I'm not coaching your dad or your mom, all right? I'm coaching you. So I want to find out about your personality, about your makeup, your character. So if we assess your ability, we assess, um, and I, well, back up real quick. I will tell you this, right now I have a player that I'm moving away from because mom and dad have gotten too involved, all right? I've been providing answers to him. We've been having some, some issues with admissions on uh, getting him into school. They have taken it upon themselves to start calling different people in the university and getting them involved in this whole process. I understand they want answers, but now I've got five, and five different people coming at me, asking me different questions, telling me different things, and they're also getting information that's not necessarily true. The way it works for me is I have to go through compliance, our NCAA compliance office, who deals directly with admissions. I don't ever get to deal directly with admissions myself. As you can imagine, Coaches could do that where that would go as far as getting guys into school. So there's sort of a liaison or go between. And ultimately, whoever in admissions makes the decision whether I can bring you into school or not, that's the final answer right there. All right? It doesn't matter that these people have called four or five other people throughout the university and they have told them, oh, yeah, he should get in or he might get the scholarship and so on and so forth. It doesn't matter. And all, all it's done is complicate things and cloud the uh, uh, situation. And I'm sort of backing away because what it tells me right now is, boy, they're, they're pretty involved in what happens if their son's not playing. You know, we bring him in here, we think he's going to be a great player and do great things, but eh, maybe it doesn't work out right away. And now he's sitting on the bench. Well, where's the, who the phone calls going to next? My boss, the athletic director, or somebody else in the school? I don't know. So scared me a little bit, and that's just based on some experience over the years in recruiting and, and dealing with people that way. Um, so that's sort of my piece on moms and dads. Yes? I have a question um, about division. You're obviously Division One, and um, I would imagine that you deal with a lot of big groups. So the people that come to you ultimately are partial scholarship, scholarship people, so you pretty much start freshman and you know who's going to be there. If you're looking at a Division three school where there's really no athletic scholarships, right. um, do you, if you're going to want to play on that baseball team, do you, do you need to know that you're going to have a commitment from the coach? And do you, maybe you don't know the answer to that question. No, I, I mean, I do. And that's, uh, well, first of all, go, let's go back to, um, to Division one and the scholarships and stuff. Uh, <coughs> Let's, let's talk about that right now. At the Division I level, uh, a fully funded program is allowed 11.7 scholarships. Why they put the .7 there, I have no idea, but that's what the NCAA limit is. Um, now, scholarships, they should, they should really be called equivalencies, is what it should be called. Private schools, where the cost of school is the same for every student there, no matter if they're from that particular state or from far away, it's, it's 
say you could probably call them scholarships there, but you know, state schools, uh, the cost for an in-state student is different than an out-of-state student. So we really have 11.7 equivalencies. So if I were to recruit all in-state players, my money would go further because it's cheaper for those uh, residents than it is for out-of-state, my money won't go as far. So anyway, across the country, I would say probably, and I don't know the exact number of how many programs out there are fully funded, but it's a lot less than what you think. I, I bet you of the 300 Division I programs out there, 50 to 75 of them have the 11.7 allotment of, of scholarships. Everybody else is somewhere in between. Some programs, when I was at William & Mary, three scholarships. Everybody thought, man, you guys are loaded all these brick buildings and this nice field in, uh, in Williamsburg, and it's just great. The three scholarships to work with. Um, so everybody's somewhere in between. Baseball is not a sport that uh, gives full scholarship. So if you're a baseball player and you're looking for a full scholarship, not going to happen. Right now, we can talk about those kids that say, oh, yeah, I got a full ride to go to this school. It's probably not all baseball money. It's probably a combination of uh, financial aid, academic money, and maybe some athletic money in there. But uh, most of the time, our scholarships are partial scholarships. I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, they're partial scholarships. So that's, at the Division I level, that scholarship sort of is a guarantee or it's a little bit of insurance that, hey, I'm on the team here. If they're putting, offering me some money, um, I'm on the team. Um, but not everybody on a Division I roster is on a scholarship, okay? In fact, throwing some more rules out, we're allowed to have a, a maximum number of players we can have on our roster is 35. Of those 35, only 27 of them can be on scholarship. So if you have enough money to put 27 guys on scholarship, that's all that you can have. And if they've got 35, well then there's eight guys there that aren't on any money. But usually there's more than that. And we do take walk-ons, and, and we can talk about that uh, a, little bit, a little bit down the road. But entering into, either a Division I program or Division III, where they don't offer scholarships, you really have to go on the word of, of the coach. And if, I'm, if, you know, if I put my word out there that, you know, the words you want to hear is, yes, you are on the roster. You have a roster spot on this team. You will not have to try out. If you hear those words, then you're, you're in good shape. And then you got to trust that that coach is going is to back that up. Um, and that's maybe where you need to do some homework and investigate that program by asking these guys right here. Hey, you know this guy over here? And they'll tell you. And you know what? He's, he's usually known for bringing guys in, telling them they're on the team, and then cutting them for You know, or they'll say, no, he's a great guy. If he tells you you're on the roster, you're on the roster. So um, that's where you need to, to investigate. But usually it's, it's just on the honor system. And so, uh, I make sure that I choose my words very carefully when you know, I'm going down the path with someone and I'm looking at them as a guy that I want them to come as a walk on. Uh, and, and I'm gonna be honest and tell them up front, hey, here's what I'm thinking. You really wanna come to my school? I'd like to have you. You know, I'm, I'm not sure. We're gonna have you come to walk on trials. And, and if you're gonna try out, we'll see how you do. And then we may keep you. Or, you know what, I really like you. I don't have the scholarship money, or I don't think you're a scholarship player right now, um, but you're on the roster. You've got a spot on the team. You're gonna have a jersey. You're gonna have, you know, a year, two years uh, to show me what you can do, and then we'll make a further decision from there. <clears throat> so that's that's sort of how that works. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, well, I mean, it just obviously Division Three, you don't have that commitment. Right. And, um, you know, like, you know, I just don't know how the guys pre-commit. So then if you go to the, you know, maybe they're all pre-committed. Well, that's why the Division three programs really, you know, if they're trying to be aggressive and get out there and recruit, uh, say, uh, juniors right now, it, it's kind of, it could be a waste of their time. They could get seven commitments from, mm -hmm. from guys that are juniors. Well, there's nothing binding that guy to that school. No, no national letter of intent, no scholarship papers. And I could walk in and say, oh, you've committed to a Division three school? 
hey, I've got a scholarship for you over here in Chance Play Division One. Why don't you come over here and play for me? And they can say, yeah, you know what, I'm going to jump at that. And now that guy's lost his, lost his uh, chance. Yes. Ryan, from a baseball perspective, what do you see as the biggest adjustment that hitters must make to get from the next to the next level from high school to your program? Um, I think the biggest adjustment is seeing quality pitching on a day-to-day -day basis, and you know, being able to hit, being able to adjust to pitchers that can throw more than just the fastball for strike. You know, at the high school level. A lot of guys who throw their fastball for strike with their off-speed stuff is, is great. And at the college level, man, you know, those pitchers, the good ones, they've got a fastball and they've got a secondary pitch that they can, that they can throw for a strike. And so the, the, the ability level of those pitchers uh, is now greater, and they can exploit their weaknesses a, a lot better. So if you're a guy that can't handle – uh, a ball down and away, which a lot of us can't. But if you know if you can't do it, well, those pitchers can, can hit that spot and exploit it by throwing fastballs and all-speed pitches. Um, so you need to be able to make that adjustment in order to hit, hit that pitch, uh, because the pitchers will exploit the exploit your weaknesses a lot better. Uh, but it's usually the all-speed pitch that guys just haven't seen at the high school level that gives them trouble.